I'm going to butcher names. No matter how hard I try, they're going to get messed up. I'm just letting you know that right now. We are in Wano. And before I even talk about the story, can I just talk about the visuals of Wano? Now, I read the manga, but for some reason, looking at the anime, we have just decided to go in a completely different art style for Wano. And I'm not going to lie, I kind of like it. If it's the theme for what Wano's going for, and it made me realize that I kind of would have liked to see other arcs stylized differently, like how would they change Water 7 or Dress Rosa? What if the manga also changed art styles? That's probably a bit too gimmicky, but like, take a look at this. I, <laughs> okay, wait, hold on. You can't do that because if I showed you, a Toei would strike me down. When we left Zoe, we split up into different teams, one of which was responsible for getting back Marco, who ended up being in the small little town as the nearby village doctor. And it was in that moment that I realized that if this was any other story, we would be foreshadowing Marco's death. Like, it's such a cliche to have this really powerful guy retire and become a village doctor, and then all of a sudden be brought back into the conflict, only to die and leave the entire village by themselves. But, but of course, this is One Piece, so, um, that, uh, <laughs> that can't happen. But we get to see why Marco values this town, right? There's a lot of countries that can't pay taxes to the world government, and they get destroyed. One of those places was Whitebeard's hometown. I think it's an interesting note that many of the strongest enemies in the world of One Piece would not exist if it wasn't for the world government. Nico Robin, Frankie, Whitebeard, Ace, all of which were characters who the world government, in one way or another, failed them. The only way this town is surviving is because it had Whitebeard's protection, and now Marco's protection, I guess. We don't know exactly how Whitebeard gathered money or how he distributed money, but we know that Whitebeard had spent all of his money on this place. It's, it's what made me realize, like, why, why is Whitebeard so beautiful? You didn't have to give me more of a reason to like the guy, but you did. It's here where we learn that one of the reasons why Marco doesn't want to leave isn't just because the world government isn't protecting this place, but because after the Grunge War, Blackbeard might potentially come after this village. Now, I don't think Blackbeard would do that, but Blackbeard is a very aggressive pirate and is extremely active, unlike a lot of the other warlords and Yonko. That was just a small little section right at the start before we dive in fully into the land of Wano. It only took me about like a year to get to this point. Uh, some people have been waiting for this for uh, probably over a decade. Let's start by talking about Wano's atmosphere, right? There's a lot of places in One Piece that are heavily inspired by real life locations. And obviously we know what Wano is supposed to be. Uh, it's France. But it is again coded in this fantasy world with the centerpiece being the moon tree thing. I don't know if that's just me. Like, you see this as a moon, right? Like, moons are significant for this arc. It's even got, like, spirals everywhere. I've rambled on so much on past arcs about the mythical spirals. And here we go again! In Wano, the spirals are in the clouds, they're in the rivers, in the waterfalls. There are so many spirals in practically every scene. Anyways, from Zo, half of the crew went to Wano while the other half went to get back Sanji. So in this arc, the crew is split up yet again, a running theme in the New World, which is kind of ironic since the New World's biggest motif is about teaming up. And it's going to be a little bit ironic because we're going to split up yet again. Our introduction to Wano is through these shots of people who look like straw hats, all in their respective roles. We got Franasuke doing the best woodworking that anyone's ever seen, and he's so proud of it. We got Usapachi, who's uh, like a snake oil, I mean like toad oil, uh, salesman who's just lying to people about how it can cure stab wounds. We got Orobi, who is being overworked and sweating like crazy, and yet she's dancing and she's trying to still be gracious. And we also got Zoro Juro, who is on trial for stealing the blade of Swordsman Ryuma, the thriller bark guy. And here's where I've been thinking. From a writing perspective, swordsmen seem to have so much value in One Piece. Like, despite there being guns and cannons, we practically know none of those weapons. But we do know a lot about swords and which ones are valued. 
Ironically enough, we haven't seen that many swordsmen or people who want to be really good swordsmen, but we do know a lot about swords. We know about like the Kitatsui, which uh, Luffy has. We know about the one that Zoro is currently being trialed for. And I like that there is this much emphasis being placed on these swords, despite it originating solely because of Zoro. That would be my guess from a writing perspective. And for reference, I also like that while we didn't technically get to see Ryuma in his prime, we do get to see one of the other stories that Oda wrote before One Piece, which I covered when we stopped at the halfway point. I don't know, I just think it's a nice reference to that, especially when we get to see Ryuma, who practically looks like Zoro. We also get to cut back on the second half of the Straw Hats who are looking at the Reverie. You know, the place where the Straw Hats learn that practically everyone is going there. I love that a lot of the news isn't just like, oh hey, a warlord or Yonko is doing something bad, even though that's here too. But it's also just informing the world about actual events. The Reverie is this big event from all over the world. And it has a lot of people that the Straw Hats know, so it'd be kind of weird if they never heard anything from them. Okay, so for almost the entirety of the New World, the crew has been split in half. And in Wano, the crew is split yet into more halves. As soon as we enter Wano, Luffy gets separated from his entire crew and he gets knocked out and his team is just gone. And then Luffy magically awakens in Wano. And this is a double-edged sword, right? Like, I kind of don't like that the crew is split off again, but I do like that we have a stereotypical wake up in this beach uh, stranded from a bad shipwreck. It's a cliche that's been in pirate stories that we haven't utilized yet. Considering Wano has been this guarded place that we've been trying to build up, I think this works. Another good place probably would have been somewhere magical like Elbaf or Laugh Tale, where waking up on a lost island that we have been searching for all along would have been practically a cliche. Okay, so Wano, or I guess Act 1 of Wano, follows Otama, who gets kidnapped and robbed, only to be saved by Luffy in... Probably one of the most hype ways we've seen, right? Like Luffy is about to be shot. We see this bad guy going in and taking his aim. And all of a sudden, uh-oh, where did Luffy go? Cut to Luffy just full on destroying the bat guy. Like he came out of nowhere. That's hype. And in return, Otama feeds Luffy her last bit of food. And this is where we really get insight into what Wano is. We see that Otama is trying to be honorable by not complaining or crying about her lack of resources. She mentions that it's a warrior shame, which is possibly something that's been indoctrinated into the culture of Wano. We see the people of Wano spending tremendous effort only to not be able to afford a living and resorting to unhealthy ideals and even unhealthier habits. This is how we tie Kaido to Wano and it's how we tie Luffy's incentive to help the people of Wano. It's not just like royalty or minx, but the people who are currently inside Wano. I like how this goal also ties back to Ace as well. It's something that we didn't have to do, but I'm glad we did. Here is where we learn that Ace previously arrived at Wano, talked to Otama, and didn't completely wipe them out as soon as uh, they stole from Ace. Instead choosing to befriend Otama, which is and does hurt because we know that Otama has no knowledge about Ace's death because of the lack of information that Wano received. It hurts just being reminded of that and her having to accept that knowing what Wano is going through. She considers Ace to be her big brother and after what Luffy did and plans on doing in this arc, considers Luffy as a brother as well. He has a very similar attitude and incentive as Ace had and he even has that Firehawk ability that Otama specifically emphasizes when describing their similarities. I'm just glad we get to see Ace again. I didn't think that would happen in Wado of all places. But I'm glad we did. We spent the first half of this act getting really used to Otama's way of life. We saw that ex Drake at one point destroyed her entire hat weaving village. We've been building up the straw hat a lot recently and straw hats are weaved hats, I think. I'm not too sure about that. I've never made one before, but they look kind of similar. And at most the entire village was waiting on Ace before, you know, uh, everybody got wiped out, including Ace actually. <laughs> So I think maybe X-Drake teamed up with Kaido? I know for sure Hawkins teamed up with Kaido. Like we see Luffy meeting up with Zoro, which we haven't seen him do in over a hundred chapters, I think. Only to immediately get interrupted and go into a brawl with Hawkins. 
Which is like the one thing that everyone was trying to avoid. It's like, don't make a lot of noise, right? For Wano, we're not going to try to go on a full-on attack as soon as possible like Crocodile and Alabasta, right? This is an infiltration mission where we're supposed to gather allies and prepare for this war and then launch out a full-on attack. And within the first day, within like the first couple of hours, you are already getting found out so quickly and this plan has already messed up. And I'm just thinking like, man, Law has like a zero to three on all of his plans. Like, why does that man plan anything? It does not work. If anything, he should just plan the opposite of what he wants so that it backfires and works for him, you know? As for the battle against Hawkins, it's where we see that Luffy is actually an amazing samurai. We get to see the Gomu Gomu pistol samurai sword. I mean, that worked. It wasn't elegant, but that worked. And to be fair, Hawkins isn't the best samurai either, right? He has this weird bendy sword which turns into a straw creature. And I don't know much about samurai, but I don't think they can do that. But I find Hawkins' fighting style really interesting compared to everyone else because he tends to play games with the little cards that forces players to act based on what the card says. And I'm wondering, is that a part of his devil fruit? And does he not have control over it? And how would that work against a really strong opponent? I, like one of his main cards that he used was just one that let the enemies get away. And that's how we were able to transition over into the next part of the story. So, I mean, I guess, <laughs> I guess it's just RNG. That's a rough game to play. Imagine pulling up a card and it's just like, oh, you killed your whole team. Whoopsie. They're all dead now. Like, why are you playing with this deck? You can take that card out. One of the good parts about Act 1 was seeing the nice people of Wano helping even in circumstances where no one could really afford to. Like, there's just something so tragic and beautiful in seeing Otama eat the food that Atsuru gave her. The story very forwardly talks about the messed up nature of the world, how even kids like Otama are unable to eat a decent meal for something that she is unable to control, with the entire town barely existing because of leftover scraps from somewhere else. It kind of reminds me of the Grey Terminal in that regard. We have the town containing leftover scraps while the actual luxurious part of town is exclusionary and now belongs to Kaido. I like that we're also told that the place of luxury was part of the Kazuki clan, giving us a little bit more context before we finally learn about the full state of Wano. That this place, Paradise Farm, was made by the Kazuki clan and was a paradise full of resources, which is a hard contrast to what people are getting right now. Okay, let's talk about Okiku's story. I have a question. Is Okiku a giant? Like, look at that size difference. Like, sure, Okiku's a samurai, not a regular human, but still, that's getting, like, white beard level height, you know? Okiku's story is centered around Urashima, who is a sumo wrestler that has a pretty high status in this section of Wano. And as soon as we hear high status, it's like, do we even have to be subtle anymore? Urashima wants to marry Okiku, mostly because Urashima's been objectifying Okiku, and he's using his status and wealth as an excuse to do, well, a lot of questionable things here. Like, in terms of uh, subtlety, it is non-existent. This man needed to be humbled. And Okiku coming in and slicing his hair is a pretty satisfying way to do it. Like, not only does Okiku utterly disgrace him by cutting off his hair, but then we see Luffy also disgracing him by beating him up in a sumo wrestling contest. Like, Luffy isn't even taking this seriously anymore. He's just playing with a guy. It was this scene that made me realize that I think we want to have more fun moments in the story. We want to have these weird, goofy moments where the characters are doing weird, goofy stuff. But I think it's just hard to have a lot of these moments, especially now that we're in Wano, because this is like the climax of the story that we have been building up to ever since Punk Hazard. And so, yeah, we can have a scene where we're trying to have fun here and we're attacking the sumo wrestler, but also uh, we got to get Otama back. So just from a storytelling perspective, I think we're always being handheld very strictly to the next story objective. Something else that I've realized is that I think smile fruits are just defective devil fruits. It's not that smiles can only create zone type devil fruits. It's that smiles aren't synthetic devil fruits that are on par or even slightly below par. 
Smile fruits are instead two sentient beings in one body. You stitched an animal and a person together and you call that a zoentype? The only successful one that I think we've seen so far is the one that Momo got and that wasn't even made by Caesar. Um, all right, let's talk about the ghost of Wano, starting with Odin because Dogstorm and Cat Viper have a lot of history with Odin, right? Odin's the guy that designed Paradise Farm. So again, we're using this as an opportunity to build a lot of different connections. And Odin was even with Rogers. With Odin's help, it explains why Roger was able to read and chisel the Poneglyph in Skypea. And while we're talking about the Ghost of Wano, it's time that we talk about the Dawn, right? The Ghost of Wano in this arc are very prevalent. We see a flashback of Odin's wife telling the bad guy of this arc that you are the moon, unaware of the dawn. So again, we're getting a lot more dawn symbolism. A little bit on the nose this time. We mentioned that samurai ghosts will one day get their vengeance and reopen Wano's borders, and that was nearly 20 years ago. And also, like, guess what? There's eight graves, and there are currently eight straw hats. Maybe nine? I don't, I don't know. Jinbei's still not here. I swear, that fish has taken so long that at this point we have replaced him with Law. But, clearly, we're showing that the Straw Hats were meant to destroy Wano, like they have destabilized every other country. And this is where we bring up the time-traveling thing, and oh boy! Like, before, <laughs> before I even talk about the you-know-what, I want to talk about something, right? And that's the fact that I'm not very good at math. For the longest time, before we even reached Impel Down, I was certain that Luffy was Roger's kid. Until someone told me that the math literally does not check out, and I realized that I am dumb. Recently, I reviewed Zoe, and someone told me, Hey, what are your thoughts about Momo saying he met Roger's? And when I saw this comment, I was like, yeah, that's pretty cool how so many characters like the Minx, Kinemo, and even Momo have all met Rogers. It kind of ties everything together. <laughs> and it's not like I didn't believe that Momo met Rogers. It's that I believed him so much that I didn't even think about it. I was like, oh yeah, this eight-year-old has met someone who's been dead for over 20 years. That sounds about right. Like, literally. <laughs> Like, literally, no brain cells were used here. I was just like, oh yeah, Momo met Rogers when he was, what, negative 12? How can Momo meet Rogers if he's like 8 or whatever? Time travel. Possibly the most questionable sentence you can ever hear in any story you read. Time travel is a little bit tricky because it can go downhill really fast. You already know why. But One Piece is trying really hard to reassure you that time only moves in one direction. Forward. You can't travel back in time, but Momo and the rest travel 20 years into the future. Why 20 years into the future? Um, I don't really know. Like, if anything, 20 years into the future, it feels like their situation would be nearly the same, if not even worse, than it would have been 20 years ago. Considering that Kaido's now thriving while everyone's getting weaker and weaker and less powerful. The only difference now is time and Luffy and Law's crew. Because if we look at Wano, Kaido's destroyed the place. Kinemon travels into the future and sees for himself that Wano is an entirely different place. The only thing they could do now is wait two weeks to carry out a raid against Kaido. Which brings us... To Kaido. In Wano, he kind of seems like a former shell of himself. He's been trying to find a lot of ways to die in honorable or significant ways. He flies around the city in a drunk state, kind of always drunk without a purpose. We're kind of getting a lot of emperors past their prime. That is the Kaido that we see. And even then, he's still pretty powerful for an emperor. Like Hawkins calls out where Luffy is, even though he was totally guessing, and Kaido utterly destroys Odin's castle in a single shot. And I'm conflicted. On the one hand, that's pretty hype. On the other hand, it's pretty lucky that Hawkins guessed it, and I'm kind of against this. Like, I already know everyone's safe. I know everything's okay. This is false tension, and at the very best, it makes Luffy and Law react in horror to this event. I do want to talk about something that I'm really glad finally happened, though. 
you see, this has been an issue with One Piece for the longest time, and that's the fact that it leans into ignoring consequences. Like, after the Straw Hats leave an area, the story keeps that area safe. Arguably, after Luffy leaves Fishman Island, something should have happened to Fishman Island. In Wano, Luffy goes to a village, sees that it's struggling, beats up the bad guys, and returns food to the people, and then it backfires. Like, arguably, he put people in danger. It's One Piece, so the consequences aren't really that important. But imagine if he went back to the village, and the entire village was dead because of Luffy's recklessness. Like, one of the major downsides of the Straw Hat formula is that they are pirates who don't stay or bodyguard their territory. And if it's not guarded, it's likely to get attacked. And that has never happened until this arc. And I love that it happened. We get to see Luffy's distraught at the potential harm of his crew. We see that Otama and the Horsewoman are injured. And we know all the stakes that are riding on this, and so does Luffy. And so it pushes Luffy to fight Kaido within the first 20 chapters of the story. And that's hype. That's not the formula. Luffy kind of knows that this is his one shot to really do anything. Like, Kaido's right in front of him, so he has to go 100% against Kaido. And it does not work. Like, Kaido knocks him out in one hit. I think this is amazing. It's like Luffy lost all of his plot armor for this chapter. And yeah, Kaido doesn't kill him because we can't do that in this story. But just like Big Mom, this isn't his first rodeo. He knows what it means to be the king. He knows how many people have tried to get to the top. And this is what happens when a rookie tries to climb to the top. It's even more glorious when you look back and see all of the crew reading the next day's newspaper and reacting like, he did what? <laughs> is, is he alive? Like, they're going to be checking the obituary at that point. And that transitions us over to where Kaido keeps all of his criminals. And I was like, okay, we got two weeks. Somehow we got to get him out. Is this going to be like another impel down breakout situation? And we look over and see one suspicious cell that keeps none other than Eustace Kid In the New World, a section all about team-ups. It's happening. We're getting the quote-unquote big three, La, Luffy, and Kid, who are all going to be working together to defeat Kaido. Like, even if these guys didn't say a word, you don't have to. You can see the intent. I'll get revenge, Kaido. And that is where we end Act 1 of Wano. As a side note, we all know that the arcs have been getting longer and longer, right? Like, it's a big, or I guess it's a long problem for the story. And so throughout this section of the New World, we've been trying to figure out ways to fix this issue. Punk Hazard split the island into two pieces. Whole Cake Island had an entire tone shift halfway through. And Wano split the arc into Axe. I really love the concept of Axe because it makes a really strong beginning and end to the story, as well as wrapping up this section of the story and giving us some nice breathing room, which the other arcs had to arbitrarily do. Anyways, uh, thanks to all my patrons. Right now I am planning my escape, and just like Kidamon, I too will be waiting two weeks to prepare my attack on Act 2 of Wano.